It's good to be with y'all. Won't you please stand and sing with us? this morning? Y'all have been sick as a dog this week. I need your help this morning. 
Can y'all sing as loud as possible? Cool? Because I'm going to open my mouth. I'm not really sure what's going to come out vocally, so I need your help. But this next one, I hope you know.
God, thank you for this place. Thank you for the opportunity that we can declare your love over everyone who comes into this place, everyone who exists in this world. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for this body of believers who believes that this, these walls are not simply constructed to keep those things in here, but to share them with the world. God, continue to meet us in this place. Continue to meet us in our interactions with our friends and family. And always go before us. So your son's in the train. Would you please be seated? Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church. If you don't know me, my name is Pastor Whitney Sheridan, and I am one of your pastors, along with Pastor Dave Comstock and Pastor Jen Anderson. And it is our delight to welcome each and every one of you in worship, especially if this is your very first time here. There might be a couple among you. It's okay, I promise. We just want to let you know that if you are looking for a church family, we would love to be your church family. Amen? Amen. And if you're looking for a pastor, we would love to be your pastors. So welcome to each and every one of you. And please be reminded that our mission here at Centennial United Methodist Church is to create authentic, thinking, and active disciples of Jesus, which means no matter how you walked into this place, either this sanctuary or this worship space, if you're worshiping with us online, you are welcome just as you are. With every question that you have in your head, with every concern you hold in your heart, with every hope you have for tomorrow, those all, you all, are welcome here. Because raise your hand if your journey in faith has been wonky. See, that's all of us. If you haven't raised your hand, I just cut you to, the, I, I know it was on your way up. So, no worries. So, just as you are, you are welcome here, and we are glad you are here. If you could please take a moment, each and every one of us, whether you've been here a hundred times or if this is your first time here, take a moment to fill out our Connect card. There are paper versions um, in your pew backs, as well as this QR code that you can open the camera on your smartphone and fill it out. This is how we know who's here. This is how we know what information you need, and most importantly, it's how we get to know what you need us to be praying with you for. You can let us know your prayer request, so please take a moment to fill that out. We are also participating in a book drive, and we've got a video um, to show you and remind you a little bit more about that, so let's take a look. Good morning, Centennial. My name is Elizabeth Simons, a member and youth here at Centennial. I am also a Girl Scout working on my Gold Award, which is the highest award a girl can earn. For my project, I am partnering with Project Home, a local homeless shelter that Centennial has partnered with in the past and continues to work with to create a brand new library space full of books and new reading activities. In order to collect enough books, I will be holding a drive at Centennial from September 18th through October 9th. During this time, we will accept books for people of all ages, but would love to receive board books, picture books, short chapter books, uh, early middle school novels, and young adult novels for the children and youth at Project Home. Here at St. Anthony Park, the table at the back of the sanctuary is where the drive will be held. Today after the service, I will be there to answer any of your questions and you can find out more information there. I look forward to seeing you and thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great morning. There we go. So if you are looking through your, uh, your bookshelves, please take out some books that you can donate to the drive. Also, while you're going through your stuff, um, in about a month, we're going to be having a clothing drive. So if you are like me and have that Goodwill pile that sits on the floor next to the garage door, yeah, I see some nodding, yeah, um, go through that. Pull out some clothes that you could um, set aside and bring them to church so that we can continue to serve our communities. All right, now I invite Pastor Jen up as we uh, recognize our third graders, right? Yes, absolutely. So if you are in third grade, you got to be a part of a special milestone a couple weeks ago. And if you missed it, we still have a Bible for you. So if you're in the third grade, I'm going to invite you forward. Third graders, yeah, come on. Come on. So one thing we do here at Centennial is we have a milestone ministry, which means that everyone from the time they're three years old up until fifth graders gets to have a special day where they get to do a milestone. And some of these girls and some of the kids over at the Roseville campus and even some more here from the SAP campus 
were all a part of this third grade milestone where they got their third grade Bible from the church. And we did some activities and some learning together about what this collection of books is and how to use it and how to work our way through it and find these incredible stories of our faith. So I'm going to invite everyone who's here, if you would extend a hand in blessing, we're going to pray for these kiddos who have their third grade Bibles. Let's pray together. God, thank you for these third graders, for the incredible journey of faith that they are on, for the gift of these Bibles. May they be, may they open up a path um, of faith, of learning what it is to be a Christian, to follow your light and your love, and to spread that to those around them. Amen. All right. And third graders, if you want to have a front row seat here, and then any other kiddos, if you want to come forward for a front row seat as well, we have another very special activity that we are going to be doing today. Yeah. We're going to have another baptism. So kids, come on up and get a front row seat so you can see exactly what's going on. And I'm going to have you guys here, if you want to go behind the green line, just so we don't step on any toes, okay? We don't want any toes getting stepped on. If you want to be behind the green line and have a seat. And while the kiddos are getting settled, can I ask um, Ezekiel and Caroline to come forward? Okay. And David, Steve, and Ruth, and Matt, and then me. You're welcome. Well, welcome, family of faith. We get to recognize this sacred rite, this traditional rite in our Christian faith. Um, of welcoming people into the family of faith through this rite of baptism. So we are glad that you are here, and we are glad that we get to do this in front of this entire congregation, because here in the Methodist Church, we believe baptism is when we get to recognize people that come into our family of faith and also make them a promise, make them a vow, as they are vowing to follow Jesus, to do their best to take care of this child and each other, we get to do that very thing. At baptism, we get to tell each other, you belong to us and we belong to you. And we are in it together. And that is holy. Amen? Amen. Amen. So family of faith standing up here, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Do you? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. Do you? Will you nurture and watch over this child? Will you listen to his questions and companion him as he explores his faith? Will you share your faith with him and accept what your life of faith is entwined together with his? Will you? And all of us gathered here in person are online. I have questions for you as well. Do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm your love for Jesus and affirm your rejection of the things that stop you from knowing God's grace? Do you? O God, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water. And on this child who's about to be baptized and receive it, may this baptism help him know that your grace is sure and that he is where he belongs, here among your people who love him, and that this baptism is an outward and visible sign of your inward and spiritual grace.
by what name is this child to be known? Nicodemus, Kiochan, Hui, I baptize you in the name of the Father. <gasps> I'm winning. And in the name of the Son. <gasps> and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who is one God and mother of us all. Pray with me. Holy and powerful God, send your spirit down upon this child as we know you already have. Guide his life. Protect him from all evil. Help him to stay close on the heels of Jesus, to lead him through life as a faithful disciple. Be with him, O God, in spirit that he might be kind, that he might be just that he might have a hunger for justice and inclusion, that he might be brave. We ask all these things, O oh God, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You only woke up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Brothers and sisters, see what love our God has for us, Amen. that we are known as the children of God. Welcome our new brother, in Christ. Amen. Yay! <laughs> Welcome, Nico. And let us pray together the prayer on the screen. We are excited to welcome Nicodemus into, into our, our family, family of faith. faith. We, promise we promise to take care of Nico and to be his friend. We promise to share with him and to make sure he never feels alone. We promise to love him like Jesus loves us because that's what being a part of this family is all about. Amen. Amen. And I, we have some gifts for Nico as well, a candle that he can, you all can light uh, a year from now and every year from now to remember his baptism, a shell to remember that baptism, and a Bible as well. So you can read those stories together. Amen. Can I tell you something? <laughs> 24 years ago today, my twins were baptized. So this is special for me. Amen. Welcome. Did and I say 24? It was 34. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And kids, if you want to head down with us, fifth graders and below, we're going to follow uh, Miss Dina out this way. We're going to follow out to the front of the sanctuary this morning. And down to Faith Walk families, if you would pick kids up downstairs when you leave worship, that would be wonderful. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This month we have been uh, in a ser series of sermons uh, called Finding Our Way. Uh, we've been looking at the, some of the parables of Jesus um, and comparing them to the work of a lighthouse which is to show us where danger lies, to show us where safety lies, and to show us the path from danger to safety. And Psalm 119 is a great reminder of that reality. Our gospel lesson comes from Luke chapter 16. Listen for the word of God. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple, and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man whose name was Lazarus, and was covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. 
In Hades, where he was being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water to cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime, you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us is a great chasm that has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there to us. Fact. He said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he might warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. And Abraham said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. May God add a blessing to this reading of the word. So I'm Presbyterian, and I grew up Presbyterian, and our denomination has this huge ranch out in northern New Mexico. It's called Ghost Ranch. It's about 22,000 acres. Um, and it's in the high desert north of Santa Fe. And if you are a fan of um, the paintings of Georgia O'Keeffe, then you have seen that landscape. That mountain that she paints so often in her pictures with a flat top on it, uh, that's called Cerro Pedernal, uh, or El Pedernal. And uh, she said that, it, that God had told her that if she painted it off enough, he would give it to her. So I assume she owns it at this point, because she did paint it an awful lot. But it's from Ghost Ranch, you can look out over this huge valley. I mean, they don't call it big sky country for nothing. And there's Pedernal kind of standing in majesty over the whole thing. I went, uh, it's a conference center, Ghost Ranch, and uh, every year uh, probably 20 uh, college students go um, and work there just for the privilege of it. Um, they have a kind of a study process that they do, but mostly they're washing dishes, taking care of kids, and uh, delivering clean laundry. Uh, and some lucky few get to work in the ranch lands and, and uh, buck hay and some things like that, but it's a, it's a marvelous, beautiful place. And when you're there, the landscape is so huge that it's very spiritually powerful because you feel the majesty of God and you feel really close to that majesty. But you also feel tiny, like, what am I that God is mindful of me? So it's an amazing, amazing place. Um, and one afternoon, my best friend Baird and I um, after we were finished washing dishes, uh, took off for a long hike. We climbed up past Kitchen Mesa and then along a long path, and we were kind of at the top of these sandstone cliffs. And the sandstone cliffs themselves are very cool. You cannot climb them because they're not sturdy. They're all sandstone. But they're in layers, so it's gray and orange and uh, yellow and gray again. It's been the floor of primordial seas more than once in the history of the world, and now the wind and the, the rain have kind of washed it away and er eroded it. So we were having a long walk and conversation, talking about religion and philosophy and friends and women and all the things that men in their young 20s might talk about with each other when no one else is around to overhear them. Um, and we kind of went further than we expected we were going to go. And we thought about how far we had walked, and we realized we were going to miss dinner if we went back the way we came. So we thought, well, you know, if we just go, like, as the crow flies, the ranch is just, like, right over there. So we went off, we left the trail, and we kept walking. And at a certain point, we got to a deep arroyo. Do you know what an arroyo is? Um, it's called different things in different parts of the world. 
uh, but in the Southwest, where Spanish is the dominant language, uh, they call them arroyos, and what they are is dry water courses. They're just places where water runs when there's water to run. So they're mostly dry, but if there's a thunderstorm anywhere, you're warned to stay out of them because even if its sun is shining and there's no rain where you are, if it's raining over there really hard and really long, the arroyo can fill with water and it can fill very quickly. It can go from a trickle to a torrent just in nanoseconds. So, and I've seen that happen. It's pretty, pretty amazing and pretty scary. But we are found ourselves uh, with uh, an arroyo that was too deep and too wide to cross. And so we could either go left or we could go right, and we decided to go right. And we noticed after <laughs> walking for long and talking and not paying attention that this arroyo was not getting narrower and shallower, it was getting deeper and wider. And we find ourselves finally at the very cliff's edge where if there was water it would be pouring out like a waterfall. And there was no way to get from there to the ranch except to backtrack. And we ended up going back the way we had come. And we did miss supper, which, you know, that's important. But we did get there before dark, which might have been a dangerous business indeed. But I want you to think about that arroyo, being on the wrong side of that arroyo, and how it separates you from being home when you want to be. It's a metaphor. And it's very similar to the metaphor that Jesus is creating when he tells the story about the rich man dressed in purple and linens who feasts sumptuously. We know a lot about this guy. Uh, what we don't know is his name. And you need to pay attention to that when you're listening to a Bible story because people who get named are good people and they're important people. Uh, and people who don't get names are not important. And the fact that he's wearing purple, which means he's rich, and the fact that he is wearing linen, which is a really nice expensive cloth, uh, and the fact that he eats big meals three times a day means nothing because he doesn't have a name. In the story of the children of Israel and their, uh, their escape from slavery in Egypt, um, there was a place where Pharaoh decides, and notice that Pharaoh just means king. <laughs> the scripture doesn't tell us what his name is. He's the king of Egypt, but he doesn't get a name. He decides that he's going to kill all of the, first, the children, the male children, of the Israelites because he's afraid of them, that they're getting too numerous. So he goes to the, uh, the midwives and he says to them, I want you to murder all the male children as soon as they're born. And these very brave midwives uh, just decide to ignore that. And when he, they get asked about it, they say, oh, these Hebrew women, they're very virile, they're very strong, and mostly by the time we get there, they've already had their babies. So we just haven't had the opportunity. They were lying, and they were protecting children at risk of their own lives. And guess what? Their names are Pua and Shifra. They've been dead for 3,500 years, and we know that their names are Pua and Shifra. They're important. Their lives make a difference. So we have Lazarus, who has nothing, who has less than nothing, he has sores, and the dogs lick those. He has no food, but his name is Lazarus. His name is Lazarus. He exists. He means something. He's important, though the world doesn't believe it. And Mr. Moneybags, <laughs> with the purple clothes, has no name because his wealth means nothing in this story. So Lazarus dies, and the angels come, and they bear him away to Abraham to rest in the bosom of Abraham. We missed that in this particular translation, but if you've sung uh, songs in church at all in your childhood, uh, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, that's what we're talking about. That's where that came from. And there's Lazarus, no longer with sores, eating sumptuously, being hugged by Abraham. And on the same day, the rich man with no name also dies. 
and he's begging Abraham to send Lazarus as though Lazarus was some kind of servant of his. Even now in the afterlife, he wants to order Lazarus around. Send Lazarus over just to dip his tiny finger in the water and give me some, some relief. And Abraham says, I'm sorry, but that can't happen. And the reason that it can't happen is that the chasm exists between Lazarus and Abraham and the man with no name, who now, I guess, is not wearing purple anymore or linen clothes or feasting sumptuously. How did that chasm come to be? Now, this is where it's really important to ask yourself, what is it, you know, this is uh, the beam of a flashlight, of a, of a lighthouse, showing us where danger is, where safety is, and how to get from danger to safety. So what is it that Jesus is pointing the light at? And you might be tempted to think that he's pointing his light on a well-constructed theory or doctrine of hell. And you would be wrong. This is not about hell, and it's not about whether there is a hell, and there's, it's not about how you're going to get to hell or avoid going to hell. It's just part of the story. It's a literary, um, a literary, <laughs> it just doesn't pay to get to be old. It's a literary thing um, that, that proves a point. So there he is um, in hell, having the suffering. And But what's important, what Jesus wants you to understand is between him the, the, the rich man, and the love of God, there is this chasm. But it's like the, or, uh, the arroyo. At some point, it's this wide and this deep, and you can step over it without even noticing. And at a certain point, it's so wide and so deep that you can't get over it to restore your experience, your place with God. And what Jesus is trying to help us to understand is that this happened a little bit at a time, every day. Because every day, Lazarus was sitting outside the gate of this rich man's house, and every day this rich man walked past him, did not notice, or did not have empathy with, or did not love Lazarus, and so did nothing to ease his suffering. And every day was a little step forward. And every day the chasm got a little bit wider and a little bit deeper. What's important here is that Abraham holding and embracing Lazarus is an image of the love that God has for all of us. What we have and what we've made of ourselves, what we've done is of no importance. What's important is that God loves us. So the fact that Lazarus has no money, has no food, he has sores on him, makes no difference. God has reached out to him and embraced him. And the rich man has not been embraced. And the reason for that is because there is a connection between the love that God has for us and the love that we have for God and the love that we have for other persons and the love that other persons has for us. The love of God and the love that we have for each other, it's not two separate things. It's bound up to each other. It's entwined with each other. So because the rich man was unable to feel empathy or concern or even sympathy or even pity for Lazarus meant that he was disconnecting himself from the love of God. He was disconnecting himself from what God had for him and the purpose for his life. And he took a little step every day until he couldn't cross over. And the rich man begs Abraham, well, send an angel, send, send Lazarus, because he's my servant even here. Send Lazarus to talk to my brothers because they need to be warned. And Abraham says, well, they have, a they have Moses, the law, and they have the prophets who are all about justice if they, you know, they have that, if they have all the information they need, they just need to listen to it. 
But he says, oh, no, 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 no. Send somebody who's come back from the dead and they'll listen. And Abraham says, you know, if they don't listen to Abraham, and they don't, I mean, if they don't listen to Moses and they don't listen to the prophets, they're not going to listen to somebody even if they come back from the dead, which is a little bit of foreshadowing about somebody else who came back from the dead. <laughs> um, the, all the hints are there. All the pieces are there. We need to pick them up and understand. And that's what Jesus is shining this light on, this bright light, is the fact that love is all of one piece. The love that we have for each other, the love that we have for God, the love that God has for us, the love that others have for us. It's all of one piece. And if part of that is missing, all of it is missing. The thing that Jesus wants his listeners to know is not that they're going to be punished for being bad or that they're going to be rewarded for being generous, but rather they need to be connected to each other day by day, step by step, if they want to be connected to God. If we receive the grace that God has poured on us through our entire lives, through all the blessings that we've experienced, but especially through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, that should have an effect on us. It should cause us to reach out in love and to reach out in um, compassion, to reach out caring about how another person feels. It should cause us to empathize. When I see that person on the street corner with a cardboard sign that says, I want some, money, food, gas, whatever, we should, our hearts should go out to that person and we should think to ourselves, that could be me. That could be my child. That could be my cousin. Empathy to put yourself in the position that other people are in, to be able to feel it as though it was you, to love that person as I want to be loved, to love that person as I already have been loved by God. It's all of a piece. And it's not just poor, homeless, hungry people by the side of the road when you're stuck at the traffic light. This goes far beyond that. There is a slight chasm between us and any person who is not as privileged as we are, who is experiencing oppression that we are not experiencing. So if there is an injustice that's happening to members of the LGBTQ plus community and we are not empathetic about that, because we're privileged, then we're taking a step, and the arroyo is getting deeper and wider. Because justice is a form of love. It's an expression of love. If we read in the newspaper about a young black man who is killed by a policeman, and our first reaction is to say, well, he must have been concealing a weapon, or he must have been trying to run away, or he must not have been cooperating, then the arroyo is getting a little deeper and a little wider. We need to reach out to all people in love and empathy. If we see that tiny little arroyo, we need to step over it in order to stand with, to stand beside, to share what we have, to share what we have, share what we are, and to allow ourselves to experience what the people on the other side of the arroyo have for us, to allow ourselves to receive from them, to receive their empathy and to give them ours in order that we might manifest the love that God has had in our lives. It's all of a piece. It can't be separated. You're not supposed to read this story and be afraid that you're going to hell because you haven't given enough money to people beside the road. You're supposed to read this story and think about how do I connect myself to the love of God, the love that God is, the love that holds the universe together. How do we make myself part of that equation? It is dangerous to keep walking on one side and ignoring those on the other side of the arroyo. And it's safe to be with God and with our brothers and sisters in every way that we possibly can. Thanks be to God.
family of faith, it's time now for our offering. There will be ushers that will be walking around with plates to pass among you. There's also a text to give option and a QR code for you to use. I would invite you to give and give joyfully. And remembering that it is first God that gave everything God has and everything God is to us in Jesus Christ. And so our role as followers of Jesus is to respond to that love, to live it every day. So may, may that be what we're doing here in our time of offering. May we give and give joyfully. among you, I would call your attention back to this table, to this place. Every single Sunday here at the St. Anthony Park campus of Centennial United Methodist Church, we meet at this table. We are reminded that we are welcome to this table. And I hope that we are reminded that it is our role as followers of Jesus, who people who seek the love of God, the mercy of God, to also make sure there are roads to this table for everyone, that there is a path for all people, for all of our siblings in faith to this table unencumbered. Our role as followers of Jesus is to do acts of mercy and justice to make that happen. So we come to this table and we remember Jesus, all he was, all he is, all he will be for us here and now. We remember that on the night when he was betrayed, he gathered his disciples, his family of faith, his best friends to supper in a room much smaller than this one. But he gathered them together to prepare them for what was to come. In the middle of supper, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and invited them to take and eat saying, this is my body. This is my whole self given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, he said, remember that, remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and invited them to simply drink, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this cup, he said, remember that remember me. Family of faith, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us gathered here in this place, us gathered together virtually and on these simple gifts of bread and cup. We ask that your spirit make them be the body and blood of Christ for us so that we may be the body of Christ in this world that is set free that is liberated in your name to go and do justice, to be humble and kind. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us our Lord's Prayer. And so we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of faith, these are the gifts of God. For 
you, for me, for us, for all, for the people of God. I would invite the communion servers to come forward, and as they prepare to serve you, I would remind you that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, or what has been done to you, you are welcome here. This table is set for you. There will be ushers that will guide you forward. There will be two stations up front. You'll be handed a piece of bread and invited to take a little cup of juice. We have gluten-free bread available, and we have sealed elements if that is your preference. But know that however you come today, you are welcome and deeply. Would you please join us for one more?
heaven thundered and the world was born life begins and ends in the dust you form your faith commanded and the mountains move fear is losing ground to a hope in you come on centennial love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God, and the power and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us, both now and forever. And all God's people said...